So there's a difference between Presbyterians and Baptists. <laughs> it's not just that, you know, Credo Baptists believe in believers only baptism, and Pado Baptists believe in believers and their children, or, you know, a single person who professes to be a believer, you know, and they and they make a profession of faith and they get baptized. But the real issue is, um, well, two things. You have the oikos, oikos, the, the Household baptisms, I believe, uh, are in the scriptures, throughout the scriptures. Um, you have the household principle not abrogated in the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> you have, you know, the, the covenant head when he believes. Uh, in Acts 16, uh, the Philippian jailer, he and his household are baptized. You have uh, Lydia as well. She believes her and her household is baptized. Um and uh, I won't go too deep into that right now, but the point is you do see that when, when there's a believer and his family, uh, you know, everyone is included. It, it's not that the it's not only the believer who's in the covenant; <laughs> anybody else is excluded. No. Uh, so I want to say that, and I want to say that uh, the doctrine of the covenants, like how we, I think it's more consistent with the Presbyterians, Reformed Presbyterians, or Pado Baptists, whatever you want to call it. And then with the Baptists, the General Baptists, or, uh, you know, the Reformed Baptists. Because they, you know, their view of covenant theology is is that only the new covenant was a covenant of grace. But none of the previous covenants were. So only, you know, the, the covenant of grace was alluded to in the Old Testament, but it's realized in the New Testament. You know, no need for two administrations. Um, like my emails keep popping up. I don't know why. <laughs> but, yeah, no need for, you know, it, it's only the new covenant is a covenant of grace. Uh, whereas, Pado Baptists, we believe that the the <clears throat> the covenant of grace began or was instituted in Genesis three fifteen. Genesis three fifteen equals the covenant of grace, and there is Reformed Baptists that they don't think that only the new covenant was covenant of grace. That's more sixteen eighty nine federalism. Richard Barcielos, he you know, and, and James Renahan and others, but. You know, to my understanding, Dr. James White, former elder, uh, what's the other guy, Greg Nichols, he gave me a book by Greg Nichols, and Greg Nichols says clearly that um, Genesis 3.15, that, that was the covenant of grace. It was instituted right there. So uh, I can see where Dr. White, he didn't really know too much about 1689 federalism, uh, but he takes Greg Nichols' view. Um, and then you have the other guy, um, Sam Waldron, excuse me, he believes, to my understanding, uh, unless he's changed his view, uh, that you know Genesis three fifteen is it's it's, it's you know, covenant of grace. One covenant of grace. Pado Baptists we specifically believe one covenant of grace, two administrations, and we'll get more into that in another video with the WCF, the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, chapter seven, in God's covenant with man. Now, let's get to the real issue. Let's let, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Nitty -gritty. <laughs> Um, so I had a conversation, uh, or a debate, let's be frank, <laughs> with some friends on Facebook and, uh, and I started it, you know, and I said, uh, I just posted something and anyways, so here, here's the issue. Okay. Abraham is the father of us all. I mean, we all agree with that, right? I mean, Romans 4, Galatians 3, 29, but let me ask you guys this. Are we as Christians heirs of the promises to Abraham? Yes or no? My friend wouldn't answer me. I asked another Reformed Baptist friend. I said, wait. Are we as Christians heirs of the promises to Abraham? Yes or no? And one of my friends said Galatians 3.29. And it said, in Galatians 3.29, it says this. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. Heirs according to promise. And then my friend says, well, how does one belong to Christ? And I said, well, we agree that we relate to Abraham by faith. If we are heirs, then why not give the covenant sign and seal, which is now baptism, right, the new covenant, to our children? Think about that. Well, my credo Baptist people listening, or Baptist, you know, think about that. Abraham, we relate to him by faith. 
and we are heirs, why not give the covenant sign and seal, which is baptism, to our children? Is there any good reason not to? I'm not being snarky. I mean, think about that. And my Reformed Baptist friend said, because one doesn't enter into Christ by birth. Hmm. Interesting. Did they in the Old Testament? Did they enter into Christ by birth in the Old Testament? Of course not. It's always been justification by faith. And one of my another Reformed Baptist friend, or he's not really Reformed Baptist. He's just a Calvinist who's a Credo Baptist. He he's not confessional. He said in the Old Testament, believers believed and were credited righteous by faith. They were not Israel by virtue of their birth, but identity in the seed. Then he quotes Genesis fifteen six. And I responded with this. Well, it was always justification by faith alone. But it is possible to be God's covenant people and not elect. For example, the Old Testament people were seen the sign, received the sign of the covenant, circumcision, in the Old Testament. Yet we know that not all of the people that received the sign were saved. Esau, for example. Uh, it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. They were both circumcised. Jacob was circumcised and Esau was circumcised. God chose Jacob and rejected Esau. Same thing with uh, you know, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael, you know, he was circumcised at 13. Abraham believed God. He circumcised, he circumcised himself. God commanded that he would circumcise his children, everybody in his household. So Ishmael received the sign of circumcision at 13, and every child eight days old received the sign as well, and the servants and everybody else. So Isaac was uh, a child of the promise. He was circumcised at eight days old. Now, um, now the covenant not only signified blessings for God's people, but it was also a curse if those who were in the covenant turned away in unbelief. The idea of being cut off or cursed is still present in the New Testament. And, and it says this in Hebrews 10.29. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Who is sanctified in this passage? I mean, how do you understand this as a Baptist? I mean, Arminians say it's about losing your salvation. You know, Reformed Baptists, I've heard uh, my former elder, Dr. James White, say um, the one uh, sanctified in this Hebrews 10, 29 is Christ. But think about it. How can Christ be sanctified by his own blood? It doesn't make sense. It's the sinner that was sanctified. He was in the covenant. and He was cut off from belief. He was never truly saved to begin with. He was a reprobate. What about John 15, 2, which says, Every branch in, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. How do you explain branches who are in Christ to be cut off? And then he just told me to check out all these books, uh, you know, one by Paul Jewett, another book by Fred Malone, uh, another book by John Salehammer, and then I told him to check out the Institutes of the Christian Religion, where Calvin talks about baptism, check out the Westminster Confession, and I told him to check out O. Palmer Robertson, Christ, the Christ of the Covenants. I said, look, this is what you're doing to me. He told me to settle down. He's more concerned about exegesis than systematics. That's what he basically said, and it's like, well, you, you think I'm putting my system before my ex Jesus? We all want to understand what the scripture is saying, you know. Um, and then um, I told him, you know, he invited me for coffee. I said, Yeah, we can get coffee, but the pressure is on you when we meet. I said, The Baptist, I mean, has to deal with the plain reading of those texts, the apostasy passages. Again, John 15, 2, Hebrews 10, 29. Romans 11, about the olive tree, etc. Also, the Baptist has to define the new covenant as an individual covenant. And I know they try to appeal to Hebrews 8, but Scripture interprets Scripture. 
it says in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Hmm. Can't be about individuals. I mean, is that about individuals? Mentions the house. I mean, think about it. So, so God only saves you and you are in the covenant. But this would mean that the children, you know, they're on their own. That's sad. Is that what scripture teaches? It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, that for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean. But now they are holy. Think about that. You have the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his believing wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. So one covenant ahead, everybody's blessed under that. One covenant ahead, children would be considered unclean if their parents were unbelievers, or one of them was an unbeliever, one was a believer, or both of them were believers. I mean, you have, again, so understand this covenantally. You know, uh, you know believing husband, for example, and because he's a believer, the children, they're not automatically believers, no, but they wouldn't, they're they, they, they are not considered unclean or, or as they would if they were living in a, in a household where the par both the parents were unbelievers uh, and they would be more worldly, right? They wouldn't be part of the covenant, they'd be unclean, but now they are holy. Why are they holy? It doesn't mean that they're saved, it means that they are set apart. They're set apart from the world because they have a believing parent. Or it could be believing parents, right? So that's how I understand that passage. And my friend said that is the responsibility of the church, namely to guard the confession and guard slash affirm those who are in or out of the kingdom. And then he said, quoted Matthew 16. He just put Matthew 16 in parentheses. And I said, again, friend, how can someone be in Christ and taken away? How can one be grafted into the olive tree and cut off? as it says in Romans 11, 17 through 24. How can one profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and apostatized? Hebrews 10, 29. Do not these passages suggest that apostates are in the covenant? Do they? I mean, it's a rhetorical question. You have to deal with the plain reading text. See, the Reformed Baptist says everyone in the new covenant is elect. All those who are in the new covenant is elect. But is that what scripture says? You still have these curses present. You have reprobates in, 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 the, in, the, in the new covenant or the covenant community who are cut off because they're never truly saved. Think about Judas. He was a disciple of Christ. Yet he was not truly saved. There's a distinction between the visible and the invisible church. The visible is a mixture of believers and unbelievers. There was a mixture of believers and unbelievers in the old covenant, and there's a mixture of believers and and um, and there's a mixture of believers and unbelievers in the new covenant. Again, scripture interprets scripture. We, we make this so difficult, but this is the truth. And I just want to say this last thing: that the Baptist view of the covenant is tradition. The Presbyterian view of the covenant equals exegesis. And as Bill Shishko said, I can never be a Baptist. Well, he said that after reading the book of Isaiah, he can never be a Baptist. So I can never be a Baptist. I agree. They can't deal with the fact that Peta was practiced by the early church. It was practiced by the early church. And they have no answer for the apostasy passages along with household baptism. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself, as it says in Acts 2, 39. My Baptist brethren interpret this as the promises to you and your children, the Jews, and all who are far off, the Gentiles. I do not believe this is what Peter had in mind, literally. Here is why. In Acts 2, it's about the Jews. The Jews were scattered abroad, and keep in mind that in Acts 10, keep in mind that in Acts 10, Peter was surprised by the vision God gave him. Peter did not know the Gentiles were going to be included. So how is, so how is Acts 2 about Jews and Gentiles? 
does not make sense exegetically. Now, I love my Baptist brothers and sisters in Christ, but I can never be a Baptist. Never. 